everyone. Thanks for coming to the panel, Cash and Prizes, How Grants and Awards Contribute to Sustainable U.S. Literary Culture. Can all of you hear me? I asked about getting mics for the room, but they can't do that. So you're all sitting in front. That's good. Um, so just to uh, remind you about what we wanted to talk about in this panel, uh, the blurb for it was the Pen America Literary Awards, the Penheim Translation Fund, the Alta Translation Awards, Prize and Treble Fellowships, the Best Translated Book Award, the NEA Literature Fellowships and Artworks Grants, besides rewarding and bestowing recognition on individual translators for excellence and achievement, how do these honors help support the healthy literary ecosystem that is essential for us to continue translating and publishing literary translations in the United States, or do they? Are they sufficient? Do they work the way they should? Uh, how do they compare to analogous programs in other countries? That fell through because we didn't get anybody from other countries to come. But, and <laughs> do we need more of them? No, I'm not on the panel. But I know. Yeah, I yeah know. but in the discussion, that's true. Yeah. We'll talk about that. So, um, Danny can just take my place. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panelists because they're listed in the, uh, in the program and people can introduce themselves as they go along. Um, I'm Alex Zucker. I co-chair the Pen America Translation Committee along with Margaret Carson, and we're going to be uh, starting the discussion today by looking at the Penheim Translation Fund. Um, but just to make sure, if you came here learning to learn about how to apply for grants and awards, you're definitely in the wrong place. And if you get up and leave, that's okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's your chance. <laughs> Wait, I'm in the wrong now. <laughs> there have been panels like that in the past, so I was just uh, yeah, want to make sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. So, um, as I said, I want to talk about whether the grants and awards that we have, or the major ones at least, are doing what we think they should to support what I like to call a sustainable culture, which is to say balanced and diverse. Um, and in some ways, I consider this a continuation of the conversation that uh, we started with Margaret Carson and Alta Price's panel at Penn World Voices Festival in May, who we talk about when we talk about translation, women's voices, in which they looked at data for just one year since expanded to five on the publication of female authors in English translation. Um, today, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, language diversity in uh, the grants that the uh, Penheim Translation Fund goes, uh, gives. And of course, these are data that can be analyzed for all sorts of aspects. We could do it for women, too, and, and maybe in a future panel we will. Um, <clears throat> but today, I'm going to be focusing on, on language. Um, diversity. And uh, people who know me well know that I like to come up with ideas that sound really good at first but don't necessarily actually work when you put them into practice. So uh, one of the things you'll learn today is why nobody pays me to analyze data. But <laughs> the idea I'd like to introduce is that of an ecosystem. And I love this work because it makes me think of slides like this that we oh, looked at when we were kids in school. and. Um, one definition of an ecosystem that I found, was, this is according to Wikipedia, an ecosystem is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, things like air, water, and mineral soil, interacting as a system. I also would like you to contemplate who in our ecosystem is the snapping turtle. Uh, oh, that's a snapping turtle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the conclusion. What is the air? Up. What is the water? What is the soil? Anyway, um, I decided it wasn't in uh, my best interest to go full hog into the into the uh, <laughs> the analogy, but. The idea is to think about um, what we're doing as part of a system. Here's another definition of, a, of a, an ecosystem from a site called desertscape.com, since we are in the desert. Uh, ecologists use the term ecosystem to indicate a natural unit of living and non-living part, parts that interact to produce a stable system in which the exchange of materials between living and non-living parts follows a circular path. An ecosystem may be as large as the ocean or a forest or one of the cycles of the elements, or it may be as small as an aquarium jar containing tropical fish, green plants, and snails. To qualify as an ecosystem, the unit must be a stable system in which the exchange of materials follows a circular path. So 
again, I may have been getting a little carried away when I use the word ecosystem, and I'm not sure if we can define a circular path for what we do. Uh, money certainly does go around. Um, if you can, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've used it before. Okay. Yeah. So we'll talk more about that as we go. But the main thing I was trying to get at is this, as critical as it is for us as individual translators uh, to focus on our needs, how much money we're paid, uh, whether or not we hold copyright on our works, whether we're named in reviews of our works, and all of that, it's also important to acknowledge that we uh, uh, operate as part of a system and that our continued survival depends on the system's health and sustainability. Um, and this has become especially clear to me in the past year and a half that I've been serving as co-chair with Margaret, the translation committee, and getting a, a bigger picture of the system that we operate in. Um, so as I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus today on diversity, specifically language diversity, using the data from the Penheim Translation Fund. I've asked some of the other panelists to consider how their grants or awards contribute to sustainable literary culture. Um, and again, uh, and not to slight this, we know that they, these grants and awards help individual uh, translators uh, by raising their profile, uh, encouraging them to keep doing what they're doing, rewarding them with money and prestige, and these are absolutely no small things. But I would also like everybody here to think about how um, they do or don't help in terms of, for instance, boosting sales, increasing reviews, or any other way that you can think of uh, the system that we operate in. Um, so the reason I want to concentrate on language diversity is because we so often talk about how translation is a bridge between societies and cultures, how it helps readers empathize with the other, it broadens our horizons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what is actually being translated? And how many works in translation come from cultures little known to readers in the United States? Uh, how many of them come from cultures we're actually already familiar with? Um, Here's an example of this. Last, last March in New York, there was a one-day conference titled Publishing Spanish Writers in English. Uh, at one point in the day, someone pointed out that for most, or maybe at least many English-speaking readers, French literature is barely even perceived as foreign anymore, uh, in the sense that you don't have to explain to somebody why it's important to translate French literature. Anybody who goes to school in the US has read French literature at some point in their lives, most likely. Uh, in university courses, many French classics are read alongside English language classics without any comment on the fact that they're translations. And this is obviously not true of most literatures, but an example which I hope will be relevant in thinking about you know, how, um, you know, to what extent are we looking at a diverse system and what not. So um, a little background on the creation of the fund. Um, you could read it, but um, it's now a little bit over 10 years old. Um, there you see the initial uh, amount of money that was given. Michael Henry Heim uh, donated it anonymously. Uh, after his passing, uh, it was made public and the fund was renamed with his, his name in it. Um, so there you see how many languages have gotten grants over the years. Uh, and one of the things that the Heim Fund uh, really um, is designed to do and prides itself on is uh, having the uh, projects be published. Um, and this goes back to the criteria, um, the agreement between uh, Michael Henry Heim and the Pan American Center in 2003 said, the threshold criteria for grant awards are the quality of the original work and the quality of the translation. Awards will be based further upon the nature of the project and the number of proposals worthy of funding in the year submitted. So that's a relatively bare bones uh, set of criteria. And we'll hear from Mo about the criteria that the NEA uses for their grants, which are a little different. Um, uh, in 2007, so after a few years, that was expanded a little to give a, 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 a clearer purpose for the fund. <clears throat> so that the, the Later criteria say, uh, the criteria for the final selection are the quality of the translation and the quality and interest of the original text. Preference is given to the projects that stand to benefit the most from the visibility that the award will give them. The specific factors that might be taken into consideration thus include, but are not limited to, colon, an author or work that is relatively unknown to American readers and deserves a larger audience, 
a younger translator whose work is felt to be deserving of encouragement and recognition, the lack of funding from other sources for the project, the lack of a publisher for a project despite its literary merits. So you see with these new criteria, uh, there's a, an acknowledgement that it is meant to support translators themselves. We're talking about translators earlier in their career. Uh, works that are relatively unknown might not be able to find uh, funding from other sources and also publishers. So it's really kind of addressing uh, uh, more the system of literary translation or literary culture than just uh, the works themselves and the, the quality of the translation. Um, so since I'm going first, I don't want to draw too many conclusions. Um, but with this bare bones kind of, oh, and also note that on the panel that um, selects the grants, it's translators, editors, and publishers. Um, so it's not just translators um, assessing uh, the grant applications. So I'm going to look at data for the grants from the past um, five years, uh, 2011 to 2015. Uh, the Pan American Center does have uh, data uh, for the earlier years, but um, the only parts of it that are uh, available in electronic form are the actual grant winners and which have been published, but not the submissions. So that would take longer to go back and dig through their files, so I'm not going to talk about those today. Um, but at this point, I also want to thank Ariel Anima, who's a literary awards coordinator at the Pan American Center, who gave me all this data. <coughs> Esther Allen, who was the chair of the translation committee when uh, Heim set up the fund, and Michael Moore, who currently serves as chair of the, of the fund's advisory board uh, that selects the grant winners each year. So um, here's a list of the submissions by language for the last five years. Um, I've got a graph that'll show this in, in different form, but you can see already, um, I guess, or at least what at this point I've come to expect, which is French, Spanish, and German dominate, and, and more generally European languages do, although you'll see Spanish is a European language, but um, a lot of the applications are coming from countries that are in the global south, uh, South America or even Central America, um, so they're not actually European. Uh, and we can come back to this if anybody wants. Um, so that's by language. Um, here's a, a different representation of it that makes it a little clearer, the, the, you know, the dominance. Um, I don't even have my glasses on, but um, that was a mistake. Okay. Um, so this is, you can see, again, fewer than 10 submissions. So we've got um, incredible um, diversity of, of applications. I'm going to move a little closer so I can see, too. Um, yeah, and you probably can't even read yeah, all the yeah, things. But I have a, a, a spreadsheet there. If anybody's interested in having you know, more information about the data afterwards, of course, you can ask me. Um, and then when we go to the ones that have more than 10 submissions, so Arabic, Czech, German, Italian, Portuguese from Brazil, Turkish, Catalan, Danish, Hebrew, Japanese, Russian, Chinese, French, Hungarian, Polish, and Spanish. Here are the grants by language for the past five years. So um, look at Chinese here, uh, more than French. Um, here I've broken down the Spanish um, by country. So look at Argentina. They are definitely head and shoulders above the other Spanish languages. Here's Spanish Spain, uh, Spanish um, Chile, El Salvador, Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico. This was actually a, a Puerto Rican author living in the United States. So that could be classified two different ways. Um, yeah, here we've got Portuguese from Brazil, Portuguese from Mozambique, um, Port Portuguese from Portugal has gotten grants, but not in the last five years. <clears throat> so here was I was talking about region, since we're you know concerned with diversity. Um, you know, Europe is obviously um, getting the vast majority of the grants. Um, yeah. uh, here we're looking at publications. So the, the blue is the grants and the red is the publications. Um, so one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that Spanish, uh, a 
again, not, not disaggregated, but all the Spanish language applications. There have been 15 grants given to Spanish language projects in the last five years, but just five of them have actually um, gotten publishers. Um, uh, Chinese has gotten 14 grants, um, uh, six of, I'm sorry, should be 14, it looks like there is 12. Um, four or five of them have publishers. Again, I have the, uh, the data in the spreadsheet. French does much better. Spanish actually has the worst record in terms of the proportion of the grants that have been uh, published. Czech, for instance, which is the language that I translate, five grants, five of them, all five of them have been published. Now, one thing to keep in mind, too, though, is that some of the, although the, the, the fund is designed to help uh, projects get publishers, some of the um, applications do come in already with a publisher attached to them. Um, so again, publications by region. So here you see that actually Asian language is doing uh, really well, um, much better compared to some of the other regions when it comes to publications. So here we can think about, you know, what do publishers want to put out? Um, do the grants that we give um, correspond to what publishers are looking to publish? And again, I'm not, I'm not saying it could be more complex than that, but I think it's at least worth thinking about. Um, so that's it for my introductory remarks, and I'll turn it over now to Mo Sheriff from the National Endowment for the Arts. So thank you guys so much. Alex, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this discussion. Um, I've only been managing the translation publisher for the NEA for about a year and a half. Um, so what I sort of bring to the table is a fresh perspective on the fellowship. Um, from what I've heard from Amy and those who Champion this whole uh, uh, initiative before, and then what I wanted to be here, hearing you guys, uh, hearing about the ecosystem, and seeing how we can better the program to serve the field a little bit better. Um, so I have a bunch of I have a bunch of uh, figures as well. Um, yeah, I put it there. So the, the last time I was in Yuma, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting being in this position, being here talking to you guys. The last time I was here, I was in Yuma, Arizona, training to go to Iraq. And so I was doing like convoy patrols and doing all this crazy stuff. So this is definitely a different role, and definitely an active <laughs> translation of life, I guess you could say. Um, so I'll just give you some figures on the translation culture itself. Started in 1981. Uh, David Wilk is sort of the champion guy for this at the NEA, but definitely Cliff uh, Becker, was the one who sort of made it what it is now over the years. And so since 1981, you know, he has awarded 410 fellowships to 363 translators with translations within 66 languages and 77 countries. Um, just wanted just to get you to see that in our artworks category, we also fund publishers and presenting organizations just like Alta. Um, so last year, this year, 2015, the NEA spent about $450,000 just on publishers and uh, presenting uh, grants. So you can see exactly where we're spending the money most. Um, this slide uh, allows you to see, a lot of you guys don't get to see the background. You see the, the announcement that we put out in FY16 for our fellows, but you don't get to see the background of what we received and how it all breaks down. So we received, uh, the next slide I'm going to go to is going to show you how the, the amount of pages we received throughout the year. Um, but this gives you just a snapshot of what last year was for us. So we received 91 applications, 91 eligible applications. Um, and we ended up funding 20 of those, which works out to be about 20%. In the past couple of years, it's stayed pretty consistent with this 20, or 20, 22, 20% of uh, uh, projects funded, uh, given the amount of applications we see. Um, and so we spent about 275,000. I believe our budget for translation is 300,000, and so there are things in the background that kind of go with the projects and what we get from panelists to figure out how much we're going to fund at what amounts. Uh, so the next thing you see is that, you know, the first out said 18 grants, Funded at 12500 to at $25,000. Um, and then, because we're a federal agency, we're concerned about reaching every state. And I think, in the conversation of the numbers, I think the NEA has been more concerned with showing that we're reaching a diverse pool in the nation. Um, and we've used our numbers in that respect, as opposed to we have these numbers, we have this data, and we want to use it to leverage something else for the field. So we've kind of just used it to say we're reaching everyone in the US as a national platform. Um, and so we reached 12 states um, in the applicant or in the grantee pool, um, and the projects represented 17 countries and 11 languages. And then we broke it down a little further, where there were 10 collections of poetry in the mix and 10 of prose. 
So this is a wider snapshot. So Alex asked me to go back 10 years. And so you can see that in 20, you know, 2005, 2052, and there's this huge influx as it goes up to 164. Uh, the reason for that, I think in the background, Cliff um, and Amy were sort of in conversation about how to better serve the field. Our guidelines used to have, to establish eligibility, you have to have 48 pages of uh, translations um, to be able to apply. We changed that to 20 pages to uh, bring in new translators and those trying to, you know, uh, and start to feel a little bit more. And we also changed the, the wait period between grants. So if you got a, a grant, um, you had to wait 10, 10 years before you could reapply. And so we brought that down to five. Okay? And also increased the amount of grants you could receive from two to three. So here's a snapshot of just the, the majority of our uh, grantees are first time recipients. Um, so 11% are two time recipients and 1% three time recipients. Um, I think that 3% is because people don't know that they can apply for a third time or they're even saving up for that third time. Um, um, I don't know. Uh, one thing to note about the, the 88%, we do a service to the field where we give feedback on applications. So a lot of those people in that 88% um, have applied more than once, called back for feedback on the application, changed what the panelists had to say or expert reader, and then went and reapplied again and ended up getting a grant. So this is a, sort of like what Alex presented. Just a snapshot of our entire, of the, of the language we receive uh, grants the most, applications the most. Of course, Spanish is at the top with 117 uh, applications we received in the last 10 years, uh, French, Italian, and German. Um, you see the percentage of uh, projects that actually get awarded in that time, and they're pretty, pretty even, the ratio is pretty even, depending on the amount of applications we received to the amount of grants we awarded um, throughout. And just like Alex said, we, we haven't broken it down to see what countries get uh, grants at what percentages, but Alex sort of touched on that a little bit. Um, and this is the smaller languages. I think it's a little bit more readable, but you can see the, the amount of applications to the grants over 10 years. I think it's kind of, it's interesting to, to note that, you know, Hebrew have 12 applications that received and only one awarded. I don't know, like Alex said, I don't know what this data is saying, but it's good to kind of see it. Um, I guess I can touch on our review criteria here. So <coughs> the process uh, for us, you guys have a different way of um, adjudicating these uh, uh, applications. We use a two-tier system, uh, artistic excellence and artistic merit. Um, artistic excellence speaks to the quality of the translation itself, and the merit speaks to whether or not this uh, original author has been translated before, uh, whether the translator seems like they can actually carry out the breadth of the project in collaboration or by themselves, um, whether there's an audience for it. And we have a two-tier process where expert readers who are both translators of the language and the genre review it and give that as a sort of guidance for the panelists to use, um, and then the panelists review it again. So there's a breakdown of the languages. Um, <coughs> Alex said we end up funding more European languages. I don't have the numbers for this, but you can see since the, the whole breadth of the whole program, these are the languages that are sort of uh, in the countries that represent the languages. I'll let you guys look at that for a little bit. And we can come back to all this stuff later on, I'm sure. So this is our big money slide. Um, <laughs> basically, I guess to answer the question whether or not these fellowships or awards are actually helping translators. Um, these are pretty impressive to us. And we had never looked for this data before until we had this profit, which is really good now, because now we're going back to try to find more of this information. And these numbers only represent what we could really find and say, there's the publisher, this is the work, and this is you know, what came of it, right? Um, a lot of times we would find announcements for a book to be released, but then we wouldn't find anything else after that. So we didn't include that in this chart. So this is just what we could find. Um, and so you see it's pretty, you know, 93%, 92% go on to find publishers, 71%. Um, the numbers as we get closer to uh, more recent grants uh, are going down because there's time needed to go ahead and find publishers. So we asked for testimonials for some of our recent grantees from FY16, and there's Kyle uh, Semo, who was just uh, awarded at uh, FY16 fellowship. And he says, uh, on the very first day the news was announced, I was contacted by three publishers requesting to see some uh, time uh, work. I've been promoting time to work for 10 years now, and I can honestly say that that's the first time that I ever, this ever happened. And he goes on to say that he's pretty much confident that he'll find a publisher for his work, and another work of that he's working on, and that that's possible. And I think what we do in the ecosystem is 
put that promotion out there. It's a big deal to have any fellowship, and I think publishers now are paying attention to the project that these uh, translators are working on because they have that NEA stamp on it. So, that's me. Thank you, Mo. Uh, next, we'll go to Erica, if that's all right. Yeah. So I don't have um, a slideshow for you. Me neither. So. Yeah, okay, good. It wasn't a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and actually, I don't have quite as much data, so I might be a little bit quicker, um, but I, I do want to say just generally that um, Alta is now in the position to really start gathering data seriously and systematically as we give out these things. And so I'm sort of taking notes and listening for questions that we might like answered um, in the future, right. next year, year after that. Um, but uh, as many of you probably know, Alta transitioned from its former institutional home at the University of Texas Dallas uh, about two years ago to becoming an independent um, arts nonprofit, which is currently what we're doing. And I don't have access to the data from before the transition. So what I have is 2013 through 2015 um, data. And uh, the prizes we, I, I'm, I'm looking primarily at the National Translation Award, which is the larger profile prize. Um, it was founded in 1998. Um, again, I don't actually have much information on how it was originally founded, but though it's possible other people here know no. something about that. Um, so it's sort of shrouded in mystery, as in, <laughs> as a lot of the early days of Alta tend to be. Um, but it is a, a $5,000 prize to an already published book. So we're coming in sort of at the end of the, the process where Chad is coming in also after perhaps a grant has been given for the translation of the process, a publisher has been found, and then the publisher, uh, generally the publisher, sometimes the translator in special uh, exceptional cases, submit it to, the, to us um, for the National Translation Award, which as I hope many of you heard this year is starting to be awarded in two categories, prose and poetry, so that is another complication on the data. I have numbers for submissions across genres. Um, so I'm just going to say some numbers quickly and then I'm happy to say them again more slowly if anybody actually wants them. So in 2013, we had 76 submissions across both, uh, all genres. So there was no genre separation. So um, in that year, we had 45 in fiction, 27 in poetry, three in nonfiction, and one in drama. I'm sorry, Erica, just mm. for clarification, uh, for, in 99% of the, we, were, we ask that it be the publisher submits and in occasional and exceptional circumstances, translators will say, I can't get a hold of my publisher, they don't have the funds to submit and I'd like to pay the fee on their behalf. So it, it's there are very few cases and we make exceptions for those cases because of course we want as many books considered as possible. And the fee is $30 for presses that publish 10 or fewer titles a year and $60 for presses that publish 10, uh, 11 or more titles a year per submission. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, is I think differentiates our prize from all of the other prizes that are being talked about is that we do have a fee for submission for this prize. Margaret's going to, yeah. in her presentation, compare the awards. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that So the detail, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, where was I? I was in 2013, yeah, which is yeah. which is as far back in time as I can go. Um, the, and, it's a long time ago. It, is, it always feels like a long time ago. Out of the 76 submissions we had, we had 25 languages represented, um, and uh, eight, uh, German was the biggest with. No, sorry, Spanish, yeah, right. Spanish was the biggest with 17, unsurprisingly. German comes in second with eight, French at seven, Arabic also at seven, and Chinese at four, uh, Russian at five, Chinese at four. So, there, uh, and then we've got a bunch of um, sort of one, two, we have one Macedonian submission, um, one Serbian, one Slovenian, uh, one Tigrinya? To, I, I was actually, when I was doing this, it was a language I had, hadn't heard of before, so I'm, sorry, I'm sure I'm saying it wrong, but I was really delighted that I had learned <laughs> of a new language. Um, and so that's 2013. Um, 2014, we had 86 submissions, uh, 42 in fiction, 28 in poetry, 7 nonfiction, 4 drama, and 5 that were unindicated or unidentified. And um, that may be because they're, they were multi-genre, hybrid, difficult to pin down, and or the publisher didn't know what to tell us. Um, and of those 86 submissions, we, uh, in, within those we had 26 languages represented. Uh, Spanish again, top at 21, uh, French with 16, Italian with 8, um, Russian had 6, German had 7. So that's, uh, it's a similar, a similar breakdown and again a couple of 
you know, smaller, less represented. We had one Urdu su submission, um, one Galicia, Galician submission. Galician, yes. yes. I was, I'm sure somebody here knows how to say that. Um, uh, so there's always sort of an interesting uh, small number of marginal or less widely spoken languages represented. Um, and this year in 2015, I actually don't have the language data for this year. Um, I was trying to get it together before this panel occurred, but it wasn't data that we collected um, because our submission process changed. And I'm going to say a little bit about that before I talk about the data that I do have for this year. So up until this year, the submission process uh, required that the every book be reviewed by an expert reader, somebody who could read the original source text and the translation and make a recommendation for whether or not it should be considered in, in the second round. So the first round, you imagine we have 25 languages with 86 submissions, that's 86 different expert readers that we need to find, including an Urdu expert reader, or a, so it was very complicated to manage and to administrate that part of it. And um, as part of our transition to independence, we knew that we needed to reduce the administrative costs of running that kind of award, and so we reversed the rounds. And so starting this year and moving forward, we have three judges in each genre, uh, fiction and poetry, and we define those loosely to accommodate for hybrid works and works of drama that are either in prose or verse go into their respective prose or poetry categories. Um, so we have three judges in each category reading just the English. They put together the long list. The long list titles go to the expert readers in with the original source language. Those reader reports come back to the judges, and from that, they pick a short list and a winner. So that um, we, we still feel that that gives us uh, the uh, part of the mission of the NTA is to evaluate the quality of the translation. That is part of what we're doing and looking for. Um, and so we uh, we thought that that gave us the best chance of still of still doing that um, and keeping it a manageable award. So this year, with the two with the new process and the two genres, we had 110 submissions, um, which is really exciting. So that means it, in and I'm not a data analyst, but in my mind, that means that separating them actually was a good idea. Um, that it, it it gives publishers more of an incentive to submit in each award. Uh, we are now giving more publicity to titles. Instead of having just one winner, we have two. So all of that is sort of attracting people to the war, uh, award in a meaningful way, I think. Um, uh, we had 110 submissions, 39 in poetry, um, and 71 in prose. And so um, that's, that's up from 28 in poetry the year before and 42 in fiction. And I'm not sort of tabulating in the nonfiction and the drama there because I don't know. Sometimes they could be one or the other. Um, and I, as I said, I don't have the language data yet for this year. Uh, I, it's something that I'm going to be putting together, but I have to actually go back and do the research. Um, I don't have any gender data, and I'm realizing that I want to start collecting that. Um, so I'm sort of making notes about what data we can be collecting moving forward. Um, the goal with the NTA is to uh, increase. So one, one thing that we think about um, when we're evaluating the success of the program is how do we measure our success. And I think you guys, it's great to measure the success by which projects get published. That's really exciting metric. And for us, it's how many books get sold and or read, which is a little bit harder for us to measure. We don't really know how to measure that yet. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll start figuring it out and working with <coughs> distributors and booksellers and maybe gathering Who are your judges? Like, like, Who are the judges yeah, at? Like so it used to be, uh, before we rewrote the policies last year, um, the judges <coughs> had to be translate. Uh, no, actually, we. I don't think we really had any. Um, it was whoever we invited to serve, whoever the board invited to serve as judges. Um, and the rules were the process was rewritten, um, and now it has to be uh, two translators and a third person um, who is uh, somebody in the industry. So we've had editors, we've had publishers. Um, this year, we had um, all translators in poetry. Uh, it was uh, Stephen Kessler, Diana Thau, and Lisa Rose Bradford. Um, last year, we had two publishers. We had Elaine Katzenberger and Barbara Appler, um, along with mm, Ah, it's on the website, <laughs> um, but so so the, the yeah. judge the judge demographic has changed to um, emphasize translators, but to also include other people in industry from this year forward. Um, Jessica Cohen, Jessica Cohen, thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was she's a great translator from Hebrew. Um, <laughs> she's she's one of the twelve. <laughs> yeah, she's she's the one Hebrew project that got published probably. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. 
So, and I'd be happy to answer other questions. That's, that's all the data that I have available, um, but if, you know, if there are particular questions, I can sort of research while Chad is talking and, and try to answer them um, or take notes later. Yeah, and we can. Yeah, that's great. great. I mean, I think one of the purposes of this is to decide, you know, which data we do want to track yeah. and, and maybe agree on some of those things. So, wonderful. Thank right, you. Thanks. Uh, so now uh, we're going to have, because Margaret's going to be comparing the awards to each other, um, we're going to have Chad go next. <coughs> so, yeah, I'll talk a bit about the Best Translate Book Award and then try and open up some questions and then you can present your thing and then mm -hmm. maybe go yeah. back to that. Um, the Best Translate Book Award, which I just looked up on Wikipedia because I never remember anything. I had our Wikipedia app. I know, that's, uh, that's uh, the easiest way because I, <laughs> so I don't know. It, it seems like it started a million years ago. We started it in 2008. Um, the 2008 was the first year that the, um, that the award was given out, but it was four books that were published in 2007. And this started um, out of the idea that there are prizes such as the National Book Critics Circle Prize for fiction, criticism, biography, all the different categories. They have six different categories for the NBCC, but there's not one for translation. And the NTA had existed, but at that point in time, it was pretty uh, it was under the radar. Under the radar, yeah. yeah. It was not. It was not widely publicized. Right. And um, what we wanted to do. What I wanted to do was to have a prize for translation as like the best book that had come out that past year that was translated, and it wouldn't be specifically like this is the the focusing on like like the NTA does on like the comparison of the original to the translation, but rather to like be a marketing device that this would be here is a great book in translation. We've been collecting from that year onwards um, at 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 three percent at Open Letter, um, we run something called the Translation Database that keeps track of every book that comes out for the first time ever in a fiction and poetry in translation in the United States. And we have data on like who the translator was, now we have data on whether the author is male or female, if the translator is male or female, um, what month it was published, who the publisher was, what the language was, what the original country that the author is from is. So we have all this data there that we report every so often and upload to the, the website, which you can all access easily at 3%. Um, but even looking at that, and we've been writing a lot of stuff for the 3% blog about how there aren't enough books that are being published in translation, that there needs to be more of this, so on and so forth. And one of the problems that I, that I saw was like, even though the numbers are seem horrible, like at that point in time, there's 342, I think it is, or 346 books that had come out in translation in 2007. That seems like a really, really small number, and yet the people that are reading books read probably like four of those 346. Like, and if you look at 300, 300 books, like how many books do any of us read in a year? Like 50, 60, maybe, if you're, if you're really like devoted to reading? And if you're to look at a list, why are you going to choose one book over the other? So I wanted a mechanism that would like somehow highlight, here are the, the best. So let's, let's narrow this down a little bit. Instead of giving you like, here's 500 books that came out last year, go forth and read translations, be like, here are 25 books that are worth paying attention to. Um, or that if you're just going to pick one, here's, here's a good list. So when the award started, it was initially like we had picked a panel of like various people who are like like Scott Esposito, that's very like schooled in like reading literature and translation. Um, Brandon Kennedy, who is a bookseller, people like that. And over the years, it's evolved um, to the point where now there's two major differences. Um, three actually. One is that we split it apart too into poetry and fiction because it was impossible to put the two together and to have anyone like poetry was never it felt like it was getting shortchanged in a lot of ways because it just wouldn't like it was harder to judge it was harder to like deal with so we separated those two and created two different panels so the panelists for poetry are poetry experts the panelists for fiction are tend to be fiction experts the other thing is in uh 2010 here at Alta, Amazon announced that they would be funding the prize at a level of $25,000. So $20,000 of that goes to the award winner. So each translator receives $5,000, and each of the, um, the authors receives $5,000. And then the last $5,000 goes to the panelists, um, and is split up among, among all of them. Um, in terms of, and then the third thing that we did that I think is important, and that ties into what you're saying about ecosystem and things that you guys are talking about too, was that the, the, we broke down the panelists. So for fiction, there are nine judges. Three of them are translators, three of them are critics, and three of them are booksellers. And the point of the whole thing was to get to focus on the part of the ecosystem that's not, the books already exist. We don't need to like 
get the translation to a publisher. What we need is people to read these books so that then the publishers are encouraged to continue publishing them. So it was always, de it was always designed to try and create a readership. Um, and that by having booksellers involved and having people who are the reviewers involved, there's a much greater chance that these people are talking about these books or like get them. We have bookstore displays at various bookstores throughout the country. Um, we even started like last year, like one a bookstore can be can win be like the official BTBA bookstore for the next year by doing displays and sending in information. Um, and that this year is like the summer is um, 57th Street in Chicago. Um, but it was designed to try and help that promotion part of it um, more so than anything else. Uh, there's something else I was going to say with that, and I can remember. So, like a lot of the judging, like the metrics would be on the sales, which are really hard to to, to figure out. Like it's almost impossible to figure out whether or not um, a book is sold because of the award. Especially like if we had ever won, if Open Letter had ever won, I'd be have I'd have real data. But we have not. So like the data that we have is like anecdotal. But um, like Anna Rosenwang, who a lot of you know, won in for poetry this past year for this book diorama that was published by Phony Media, and they sold out of it and reprinted it with a BTBA winner logo on it. Um, and we have had a lot of coverage. Like anytime that the, the words announced, um, Halal Itali at the Associated Press writes an article for the long list, for the short list, and helps get like some some information out there. And the other thing that we started trying to address the like marketing side of this was that every week um, throughout the year, a judge from the from the award, either poetry or prose, writes a post about books that they're reading. So we try throughout the so there's at least fifty two posts throughout the year that are highlighting books that are being considered for the award. In terms of like what's considered, we have no entry fee. It's the same as like the National Book Critics Circle is our model. Anything that's published is eligible automatically. The, the judges are like finding the best books. We encourage all the publishers to mail in everything so that they see it and can read it. But if someone doesn't mail something in and a judge has read it, it still qualifies. Like it's, it's fine. They don't have to submit it in that, that, that sense. Um, but it was all designed to try and be trying to be more promotional for the books, which is where your ecosystem thing ties together, where I think that the readership creates a demand that leads to the author being the snapping turtle, who then eats the translator. Because the author needs to have some motivation, they need some food, um, they're hungry. Where's the book? Where's the book? The books are the books are the end, I think. So the the they're the ones that will actually map out the flow chart. Yeah, we don't have. I don't have the. I didn't do any of the sets on the language because what we or any of those things because every book is eligible. So I have. If you just go to the three percent translation database, you can see that, and it's the same. It basically mirrors what everyone else said. It's always French, German, Spanish are the three top languages. Then it shifts every year between like different Scandinavian languages, especially when there's like a big crime wave or like Chinese or like, or sometimes it'll be like Arabic will shoot up and be like, that's the number three, three language. And the reason is because the, um, the uh, American School of Cairo produced like 12 books that year. So suddenly like that's like, but all the numbers are always super depressing. Cause like after like, at, uh, the number of languages that have more than 10 books that are published in translation in America, it's like eight. So like once you get down be below that, it's basically everyone's got like three, four, two, one, and it's, it's sort of sad to look at. But the one thing that's encouraging, I think, I don't know if, the, I don't know if this is for the award, but like the thing that's encouraging is that over the course of the past however many years it's been now, eight years, I guess, um, the number of publishers that have published books in translation has increased dramatically, from like 110 initially to about 150 now. So like that's significant, that people are at least publishing things. We get co contacted constantly by like small presses I've never heard of that know that the award exists and want their book to be considered for the award, which I think is important. Um, one of the things that uh, to open this. Oh, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll let, yeah. let Wait, can, can I'll I ask a yeah. question? Yeah. And um, so you meant you started to touch on this a little bit, but you said you get contacted by small presses that yeah. you don't even know exist, and there. So there's a huge part of the ecosystem that like doesn't print books with ISBNs, doesn't have a distributor. What What about those? People? Okay. The way that the way that we distinguish, and this is part of what I think you're going to yeah. say too, is that um, if your book is not available to a store to be bought, we don't. It does not mm -hmm. get included in the database. So if you have an ISBN or you're in, even if you don't have an ISBN, but you're in WorldCat and like available outside of Amazon, fine. That's totally fine. It's just literally if like, because we don't want it to be, 
if um, if a book wins and a bookseller is like, I'm going to sell this, but I can't buy it. Like, I don't know how to, there's no way to get this. That defeats the whole purpose. So the one qualification is that the book is available in some means that people can purchase it. Otherwise, it's outside the ecosystem. Otherwise, it's outside the ecosystem. It's an alternate ecosystem. Yeah, there's an inner matter. Inner matter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so um, I am interested first in looking at literary prizes in a, in a larger way, um, in the larger picture, and I think it's really wonderful that we can put this pr presentation within the context of last night's award ceremony, because that is sort of the culmination of, uh, when you talk about literary prizes, that's the culmination of all the work, all the thinking, all the logic, you know, what's, what do we want to accomplish um, with this prize? Um, I also am kind of thinking of maybe looking at literary prizes in a more theoretical way. Like, um, I want to consider the questions, the reasons, the impact um, uh, beyond the yearly event, beyond the yearly cycle that um, we, we three are talking about with, with our literary prizes. Um, I want to consider what's the function of a literary award? Oh, and picking up on Alex's brilliant <laughs> literary ecosystem, you know, what's the function of this prize within the literary ecosystem, within the, the whole publishing scene, and within the, within the literary marketplace? Um, and, and why does the literary world want or need literary prizes? There seems to be a demand for them. They happen, and, they, and, they, and there are new ones coming around all the time. You know, what calls them into existence? And I think, Chad, you were, you were answering that with the BTBA, why that, why that <coughs> began. Um, do the awards um, compete against each other in, in a good way, uh, hopefully? Um, and why is a gap seen in the existing awards and thus prompting new awards? Um, what, what would a history of literary awards look like? Um, and, and it would be interesting to consider the lifespan of a literary award because there have been many, particularly coming, um, uh, having, knowing a little bit about the history of Penn, I know that Penn started in 1922. There have been tons of literary awards. Not all of them are still around. So, you know, what's, uh, what, what was going on with that? Um, what keeps them going? What brings them to an end? And now, thanks to Alex, I'd like to think about recycling them. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, just get the circular path going. Um, I think it's also uh, would be good to reflect on um, the, the long list, the short list, what's the function of these in terms of the literary prize? And um, this is also, I know with the, um, with the BTBA, that, that, that's something that um, was copied, I think. Um, you, you know, you're doing it, and, I, yeah. okay, and, and a couple years ago, um, Penn started doing the long list and the short oh, list, and I think yeah, they're much yeah. more yeah. now attuned to the sort of the marketing, you yeah. know, the value yeah. of it, not just the, the prestige mm -hmm. value. Um, I also want you would like to consider the ceremony, you know, just thinking of last night's ceremony in the sort of the, the, the ritual, the, the presentation, the build-up, um, you know, the winner going to the podium, speaking, and you know, acknowledgments, and it's like that's all part of this this process. And then all the the attendant publicity. And this morning I woke up to lots of emails of the press release from the uh, NTA <laughs> awards, and I think you know that's all part of it. Um, so. Um, Getting back to you know, the question of prestige, I think that's the first thing that, that most people think about with the, the function of literary prizes. And it is, it's a recognition from judges who, um, well, depending on the prizes, you know, the NTA and Penn, it's, it's your peers, it's your translation peers, your translator peers. Um, to the individual who's awarded, you get the distinction on your CV, on your bio, it's on the blurbs, on your, on your future translations. Um, and it's also, I think, an honor and a distinction to the award giver, to the organization that has put the, the prize together. Um, it's um, now this this question: when when prize-winning translations are publicized, does that influence readers? These are things. These are metrics. You know, how, how do we how do we get at this? How do we get at this information? Um, do readers seek out prize-winning translations? I, I, you know, we hope so, and that's why the stickers go on the books, and you know, there's publicity. Does the, does the prize or award really enhance the status of the author, the translator, and, and, and to what degree? You know, how, how does that last, that aura? How, how will that last? Does it inspire others to translate? Um, OK, so that's my um, sort of speculative part of the presentation. Now I want to look at the, more specifically at the Penn Prizes. And Penn, um, as I just mentioned, it goes back a long time, started in 1922. The Penn Translation Prize, we have two main translation prizes. Um, uh, and there's a separate prize for poetry. Also, there was a split at some point. Um, so the Penn Translation Prize is on our um, uh, description of the prize. It's formerly called the Penn Book of the Month Award. Oh, right. And it's, this started in um, 1963. 
And that's also very interesting, you know, thinking of what, what calls a prize into existence. I'm, and I haven't done the research in the archive to look at the correspondence in the minutes, but I think this is a post-Sputnik kind of idea, right, that the U.S. has to open it up to um, other countries. So I think that's maybe. Um, so if this honor was founded in 1963 through the efforts of the Penn Translation Committee and was the first American honor, award to honor the art of the literary translator. Okay, so we have like two things there. This is the first, and also it's honoring the art of the literary translator. So the translator is really at the heart of this award. That is the whole criteria. That's all the guidelines that this description gives us. So, you know, it's, it's pretty much up to the judges, and the, the judges up to now have all been, I believe, uh, translators. You know, how they're going to interpret, what kind of criteria they're going to. Because that's always a problem when you're, when you're judging a translation. You know, it, it, it's, it's a matter of the, the original work and then the, 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 the work of the translator. And, you know, how do you sort of apportion that in, in deciding on a winner? Um, or do you? Um, uh, okay, and then the Penn Award for Poetry and Translation, it's, it was started in the mid-90s, and I think for the same reason, right? That you can't really combine them together effectively. Um, okay, impact on sales. Now, I do have a report from Scott Esposito, because our winner last year was... Um, Baboon by um, Naya right. Marie Eight, yeah. and uh, published by Two Lines Press. And so I asked him specifically, and he would, wouldn't share <laughs> sales information with me, um, but he did say that um, it was that award, the Penn Translation Award um, for Baboon, was definitely one of a number of factors that have that kept that book in the public eye and and selling well more than a year after its, its original release. Okay, so without putting a number on, he said, yes, it did have an effect. He also mentioned, I mean, there, and there are many other awards out there now. He, he mentioned the Firecracker Award. This was the first time I heard the Firecracker Award. It's, have you heard it's, of it? It's, yeah, yeah. It's, I think it got renamed to, it used to be, it used to exist and then it went away and then it came back last year. Yeah, so the, yeah, the first time it's been back was last year. And, and, and one of their translations was also honored. <coughs> yeah. So, and that also helped, he says it helped the sales. So that's some, uh, some evidence. Um, okay, now I just, uh, so let's look uh, at this, uh, this spreadsheet that I, I uh, sent around a, um, a questionnaire to Erica and Chad. Um, just, oh, yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, do you all, yeah, actually have it? Okay, great. Um, I mean, there's, uh, again, there's a lot of data here to sift, but I think um, it'd be interesting, you know, just if, if you want to... Uh, the categories here in terms of the differences and overlaps and similarities, um, how, the, this, how the prize is described. I think this is an important moment for whoever is bestowing the prize to sort of define it, right, and, and, and set sort of parameters and values and state it right there. And, and probably a lot went into crafting. I know the NTA was, you know, very... Um, a whole committee. A whole committee, that. right, working.